Thank you for having me here today. I'm, I'm truly excited to be part of a program like this. Um, I'm an ecologist, I'm a conservationist, and, and these subjects and, and conservation media, it's, it's very exciting, not just for me, but really for my children. And it's become more and more important uh, to consider those future generations. And so what I'll be talking about today is really, it's, it's a problem with extinction. We're, we're losing animals on a, on a pace that's it's terrifying, and there's something that we can do. And that's what I want to talk about, is how do we motivate ourselves, and how do we get excited about a program or projects that we can all be a part of and we can all get excited about. And so my title is Connecting Fragmented Habitats. And we're going to be talking about how Joe Blow that owns one acre, three acres, a half an acre, how can we get involved and how can we make a difference? And how can we make better habitat? And uh, this is all about extinction. And uh, you know, what really got me uh, kind of harnessed behind this talk was uh, my eight-year-old daughter came up and asked me, he said, uh, Dad, are all the animals going to die? And, and that was a terrifying thought, you know, how do I explain to an eight-year-old that, you know, some extinction is natural, but what's going on right now is, is not. And, and we need to do something about that. I don't want other eight-year-old kids coming up and asking parents, you know, are all the animals going to die? Extinction is forever. We, need, we can fix that, though. So, um, you know, this, this kind of behavior, these pictures where standing on a mountain of bison skulls was kind of a neat thing, I think it's gone. The perspectives of, the, of our society, of this over-exploitation and over-exploitation is okay, is gone. So we're ready and our society is ripe for change. And so I think that uh, with some motivation, we can do a lot to never have something like this happen again. But we are in a mass extinction. It's a driven mass extinction by humans. Human progress, if you will. Now, we can work through that, we can fix those problems, but I mean, one of the major problems is habitat loss and habitat destruction and, of course, fragmented habitat, which we can work on, we can fix, we can do better jobs. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today because, frankly, I don't want my, my daughter to come up and uh, I have to explain to my kids that of over the a little over 5,000 species of mammals, a quarter of them are going to face extinction. We need to fix this problem before it's too late. Ads like these are, are terrible. No one wants to see these animals go. No one wants to see the, the penguins and the whales and the polar bears. But in our backyard here in Montana and then across the West, the United States, and all over the US, there are things that we can do so we never have to think about these kind of issues. Now this is a figure here on the x-axis is time. And uh, you've got extinction events and uh, or extinction animals and, and the population. And What's kind of nice, this, this figure is nice because it shows as population increases, so does the number of extinct animals. And what happens is, you know, you have more people, you take more land in agriculture, it's more urban sprawl, more houses, you lose habitat. Well, how can we be a part of, you know, still have our houses and still increase our habitat? And there are ways that we can do that. But as, you know, our population increasing, we need to be thinking about our yards and our habitat a little bit better. And I think that will help a lot of these extinction problems. Now, everyone thinks of extinction, oh, that's a tropical problem. Tropical, and, and to some degree, that's correct. This figure is the hot spots of extinctions, where extinction are likely to happen. And what you'll notice is the northern North America, there's a lot of hot spots. There's a couple reasons for that. Part of that is all the energy exploration that's going on in those areas, but also, the, the climate that's there, the animals that live there, really fit into a very narrow range of habitat characteristics. And so much, you know, any change in those northern areas can be very, very tough for those animals. And, and so we need to be smart about a development that's happening there, and the people that, in the areas that, you know, that we're already inhabiting, how can we improve our areas so we can still have the energy development without a massive loss of life? This is the, uh, Carolina parakeet, it was uh, driven to extinction by overhunting for feathers. And uh, you know, I've read stories about you know, people sitting out on their porch and, and listening to these birds, and, and it kind of chokes me up. And, and I think, oh man, I wish I could have experienced that. This is a pasture pigeon. My, my students love to give me a hard time, because every time I can talk about pasture pigeons, I get excited. This was a force of nature. These birds had flocks that were four miles wide, one mile long. They blocked the sun when they flew by. And, and, it, and it chokes me up 
Because not only have I never seen these bastard pigeons, my children have never seen them. And they never will get to see them. And that's terrible and terrifying. And, and uh, there was a TED lecture not too long ago by uh, Stuart Brand. And he talked about technology that we now have to re-engineer passenger pigeons and other extinct animals. And that got me all excited. I'm like, oh my gosh, maybe my kids will get to see a flock of birds that is a force of nature. The next step to me, though, because I am a scientist, is well, do we have that habitat? Can we put these animals back into our environment? Oh my gosh, you know, how do I make sure that my kids get to see this force of nature? And that's what led me to my, my topic today of you know, how can we connect our habitat that we have today, make it better, and create even some more. And uh, so this is a uh, satellite picture. On the left-hand side is um, 1974. On the right-hand side, same picture, just later uh, in the 2000s. The black line denotes a park. And what you'll notice in 25 years, from, you, you have this change from the green to the white. The white is uh, agricultural ground, urbanization, progress, if you will. And so you'll see that we've lost a lot of habitat. And the habitat outside the park is fragmented. It's, it's in small little clusters. And those little clusters are, tend to be isolated. So we need a way to connect those habitats in such a way that they almost make one bigger one with small travel corridors. And so I'm calling these connected. All, what they are are highways. They're super highways of, of areas that uh, animals and uh, amphibians and whatnot can travel with, uh, with cover, with safety. Anytime these animals get outside of cover, predators have a heyday. And that's one of the things that we need to work on. How can they travel from these fragmented habitats and be safe? And so travel corridors create a uh, safe place where they can find forage, they can find cover, and they can move from one core habitat to another. Well, isolation is, is definitely a problem because it affects dispersal, it affects, um, well, just how those animals live. We lose biodiversity, we lose genetic diversity, and so there's different types of dispersal. You have migratory dispersal, you have just day-to-day -day regular movements, and so regular movements include, like, so you're in a nice little core area, you got plenty of food, but you don't have any water. Well, that means these animals have to leave those core habitats to find water. And every time they leave their core habitat, they're likely to be taken out by a predator or some human activity. Running into a building, getting run over a car, or whatever. And so if they have a travel corridor to, to leave to get to another one, they're going to be much safer. We have a better possibility of that population surviving. And then arguably one of the more important aspects is after the young have grown and maybe a core area is too dense, the population has to disperse. If these animals have to disperse and they're dispersing out into hostile environments, they're going to find trouble from predators. They don't know how to escape predators. They don't know how to escape human artifacts. And so they have to have a safe way to do that. Otherwise, our dispersed populations are not finding new homes. They're not reintroducing themselves to core areas that may be even new, that we re re return to a kind of a wild um, style of living. And so we're losing populations very quickly. Um, and then I talked about you know, what, what lands are we talking about? Well, agriculture, urban, suburban areas are very hostile for these animals. And so we need to make it better for them to travel. And it's something that we can all do. Um, well, what, what we, what's the first step? Well, the first step is protecting those kind of habitats that we already have. We have a lot of linear landscape that connects habitat along our rivers and streams. Those are perfect. But the next thing we need to do is we need to go out and look and fill the gaps. What are we missing? What parts are, there's no way these animals can cross. And we can do that. We, can, we have the technology. We have satellite imagery. We have remote sensing, Google Earth. All of those are great technologies to find out where are we missing places and areas to create travel corridors. Um, and then once we do that, we can start locally. We can start small, grow and develop into regional and even national areas of these connected habitats. This is an architect's view of a, of a um, essentially a road crossing. Highways become a, almost an unsurmountable barrier for small mammals. 
Large animals like deer often can get through roads, but those smaller animals really have a problem. And so any kind of crossing that you can create, this wildlife crossing, creates a much, much more safe and, and really predictable area for them to cross, which allows them to find a safe way across to help populations that may be in smaller fragments or just that aspect of dispersal. This is an actual road crossing that was built. These are starting up here in places in Europe and even um, some of the east coast of the United States you're starting to see these kind of travel crossings. This is a huge improvement and it's, it's just going to show there's been a change in society and this is an important concept that we need to be working on. It, it's all about these small island habit, habitats, these fragments that have small populations. We would almost call them metapopulations. They're really likely to go extinct because they can't handle environmental change, small disturbances, and population isn't large enough. If we connect these little island habitats together with the larger core habitats, we create a lot, much better landscape, much larger landscape for which animals can inhabit. This is an um, actual project that's going on on kind of a small scale. The reason I pulled it up, it's prairie. We're in Montana, a lot of prairie. It's a good example of what small communities can do to connect these core habitats. Golf courses. These areas where, you know, in our, our kind of our ur suburban or even urban areas, golf courses are great examples of habitat that can be used to connect pretty large areas. And these passages are perfectly safe for, well, for the most part for animals to travel. They've got, they've got forage and food. They've got, um, you know, cover from predators. And they can be pretty safe. This is a wonderful project. This is in southwest Australia. It's called Gondwana Link. And they've been working for over 11 years. And in 11 years' time, they've connected over 560 miles of habitat. So that's through uh, purchasing land, donating land, all that kind of stuff. Kind of in a bigger um, area. And uh, you know, this is, this is something that in the United States we can easily match. We can do this as well. And we can do it on a, uh, start on a small scale in our backyards, in our, in our little um, neighborhoods. Neighborhoods can start to do this together and create this kind of landscape connectivity. Because that's what it takes. You know, we think of these big habitats, we need something big, we really don't. We need 10, maybe 20 feet to start with. And this, this little living fence here, going through this agricultural area, the animals have cover. Some forage, they can get out into the agricultural areas to get food, but they've got cover. And you create this longitudinal area where they can travel, they're safe, and they can move to find other of their species for reproduction or just better habitat. How about just planting flowers? What a great opportunity. Take the back of your, of your yard, the 10, 20 feet that are back there, talk to your neighbors on either side, talk about planting flowers. It's okay to put a gazebo out there. You get to see butterflies and bees and uh, birds and all these small animals that are going to use your little flower patch as a highway to travel. And all you have to do is get your neighborhood involved. Get your neighbors involved. It's, it's very, very exciting. Now, if you be like me, I'm a lazy mower. I like to leave grass, right? And so I, you know, right back 20 feet, oh, I don't need to mow that. So that's fine. That's all you need to do. It doesn't have to be flowers. I'm lucky my, my neighbor behind my house leaves uh, about an acre grass. My kids will sit out there all the time because there's baby birds out there nesting all, you know, the birds are nesting. We have western meadowlarks and sparrows out there that nest all summer long. So there's always baby birds running around, bubbling around, trying to find food. There's practicing singing. And it's a great opportunity for kids to be involved and see in nature. When it's wet, we have frogs that are singing. And uh, it, it's just a great opportunity for your kids and our future generations to be a part of nature and still be in the neighborhood. And that's what it takes. A little lazy mowing or some flowers and you've got a corridor. Talk to your neighbors. Now you have a longer corridor. Maybe they'll talk to their neighbors and you've got a longer corridor. So not only are you making these wonderful travel corridors, you're actually increasing the overall land that we have in the habitat. So, so we have, we're getting more land, we're getting travel corridors, and we're getting people involved. And that's, ter that's truly important. Now, obviously, especially in the West, agriculture is such a big part of our landscape. 
Well, we need to include those folks. Right here in the West, you can't throw a rock without hitting a farmer or a friend of a farmer or a family member of a farmer. Once they see our landscapes and our neighborhoods going into these travel corridors, they're going to get excited about that too. Farmers love our landscape. They love our wildlife. This is a, a row of flowers between two agricultural um, areas. And you have a corn habitat here, and, and there's actually another one right here. This is a perfect place for animals to migrate back and forth in these wonderful little, just a, just a strip of flowers. That's really all it takes. A strip of flowers could save our habitat. This is a uh, fence line on the other side is grazing. Um, this is just flowers, left alone. It's a perfect corridor. If we do this, if we create a connected landscape, we have a safer place for our animals to, to move through, we have more landscape that is, that is a better habitat, it's going to be better for biodiversity, better for genetic diversity, and it's going to be better for our future generations. And who doesn't want to see wildlife in their, their backyards? Who doesn't want their kids to experience that wildlife and be a part of that? And it's, that's incredibly exciting. And we can get excited about that, not just for us, but for our future. And if we work hard enough, we, we create something that's, that's large, it's on a regional and a national level, we leave something for future generations that's powerful and exciting and that people can get involved. Everybody that's here can get involved. It doesn't matter if you have an acre, you know somebody that has an acre, or you have 10,000 acres. This is something that we can all be a part of and expand upon to create something bigger than ourselves. And if we work hard and we work together, we can create a landscape that's connected across the United States and even into other places like Canada and Mexico. And then that, uh, that group with uh, Stuart Brand, who's working on re-engineering extinct species, has a place to put those animals. And then we have an exciting landscape for our future generations. We have an exciting landscape for my kids and your kids. And I'm excited to be a part of it. And uh, so thank you for listening to me.